going to go over the introduction. Uh, I, I'm also going to explain to you what our platform actually is and why it's not homogeneous, um, how we started and where we actually ended up and what we're looking forward to doing next. So I'm Max, um, when SRE engineer, whatever you want to call me, I work for DT. Uh, I currently live in Germany, in Ulm. Uh, I like to drink coffee. And uh, if I publish the slides later, you can just click on the links to find me. Um, from the company I work for, um, you probably know Telekom. I work for, the Deu uh, te uh, for Deutsche Telekom Technik, which is a subsidiary of Telekom Deutschland, so it's just Germany. Um, and the SHIF, the project I work for, is a project mostly on the NT side, so we handle network technology workloads, um, so the 5, 5G core, but not public-facing uh, things like the customer portal. What is our platform? Um, it's an internal GitOps-based Kubernetes cluster as a service platform, almost exclusively built using open source components. Um, we're using cluster API under the hood. We have a lot of clusters because we do multi-tenancy on a per-cluster basis. Um, we use GitOps for everything. We don't do manual actions at all. We have clusters that do all the management. We have edge clusters. No, it's my PC. So, what are our goals? We want to build reliable Kubernetes clusters with a well-defined API contract for our internal customers, so we're just internal only. Um, we want to basically provide clusters for internal customers wherever we need them. Um, given our company structure, we have a lot of different things to cover, from core data centers to also edge sites. We want to present a mostly unified experience for all of our internal customers, so that they don't really need to care on which cluster and which environment they are. And we basically want to prevent them from building components on their own that should be unified. So we provide them, on top of a just a Kubernetes cluster, a monitoring stack. We basically build a log shipping daemon that already collects all application logs that you not just need to tell where to ship it to. Um, we also do the complete ingress side. So you just basically just pop an application into the Kubernetes cluster, and that's the thing you manage. Everything else is managed by us. Our environment is quite diverse. Um, so we have sites that have quite different networking architecture, where we just have layer two networks, so classical switches with VLANs. We have ones where we actually have BGP to the uh, data center edge, for example. But we also have modern sites where we just have layer three and no layer two, where everything is just VGP VPN. We, differ we also have different underlying infrastructures. So we have vSphere on the one hand, and we also have bimetal clusters on the other hand. For storage, for example, we have very different storage providers. So we have vSphere CSI, we have pure storage, we have NetApp, um, and a few others, depending on which data center you're in. They have different feature sets, they have different CSI providers, and we all need to encapsulate that. And we also have a huge variance in what applications we actually have on our platform. We have small web apps that just basically do things like running a Node.js application to provide a UI for managed services or interact with uh, backbone components. We have an Elasticsearch instance that has multiple petabytes of storage, but we also have network-heavy applications like a 5G core that require a lot of custom modifications to the networking stack because they're a lot more complicated than just a singular network interface on a pod. We initially started in 2019 with a proof of concept of cluster API on vSphere. Um, in one data center with one vCenter, still using Flux v1 at that point, with a very simple repository layout. Every cluster had its own repo. We just placed things there. Flux applied it. 
and that just worked. Um, we mostly used upstream charts for everything, so or build charts and upstream them in, uh, if we needed to, and just had one YAML file for every cluster that just contained everything you wanted. But after we scaled, we found a few issues. A, we needed to introduce environments for people to actually test what we're doing and for us to actually manage what we're doing for, uh, and present customers with a good track of what we're delivering for them. So we now have dev for internal development, test for cross-checking internal development against tenants with a very bad SLO SLA. So it's expected to break occasionally. Reference for applications to actually do all of their testing and production, which is literally what it, meant, uh, what it sounds like. Um, we also needed a way to basically name our clusters because we have a lot of them by now. Um, we also needed it to be human readable because a lot of the systems in our company that clusters need to interact with are not fully automated and people need to be able to understand what they're configuring. There's, there isn't an API for everything that we have. We still were using one repository per cluster at that point. But we ran into issues. So after we scaled, um, we ended up with a load of uh, Git repositories. Every repository needs uh, permission management. Um, you need to provide SSH keys, uh, as deploy tokens, and all of that. We're using GitLab. GitLab has some API bugs, especially around deploy keys, so it was a bit annoying to uh, automate. And it's quite the opposite of uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, we have shared secrets because of the underlying infrastructure. Rotating them was a pain because you needed to do that synchronized across like 20 different Git repositories. Um, you need to make sure that you really went into every repository and did your upgrades. And automating Git repositories isn't that easy um, because you still need to open up merge requests everywhere, go over that, uh, and scale. After that, we basically started to move everything into one repository. We used the cl cluster ID that I showed earlier to build a folder structure um, so that every cluster now has its own dedicated folder. And then we basically split out duplicated config into different trees. So we had one tree for development for the development environment, one for each site. We just separated them and merged them together using Helm value overrides. Looks roughly like this. So we have a customization for each cluster uh, on the bottom, uh, bottom left that contains both the customizations that applied everything else and also the uh, config map for cluster-specific configuration. There's not only environment, there were a lot more stages in between, but basically you, keep, you kept track of versions on an environment basis and everything else just added to that configuration. It's not that easy to manage that. We figured that at some point we actually need to do stage rollouts. Uh, that was hard because everything basically shared one version and if as soon as you started to upgrade one environment everything rolled the number of config sources and permutations basically skyrocketed once we started to onboard more uh, sites and figured out oh that's different here we need to change configuration here here and here um, rolling that out was re uh, and managing that is really, really complicated because you need to know exactly where what is configured um, and the number of people that actually were able to do that dropped off quite significantly because not everybody had the time to really follow up with what was added. Flux, uh, in that time, we also migrated to Flux v2 from Flux v1, which was easier, but it was still very complicated. So after that, we basically started to look at different options. One of that was customize overlays. So basically, 
trying to split as much uh, into different customized files, which wasn't also wasn't working due to the complexity and number of changes that we have that are sometimes mutually exclusive. Um, we also looked at tooling to just stamp out resources before committing that to Git. Um, there's basically not good config management for any of, any of that. We tried to basically use pu uh, Puppet Hira as a hierarchical database, but that also wasn't working that well. YTT was something we looked at, Helm subcharts, where we just basically discovered that subcharts in Helm are very, very broken, and you don't want to use them at all. Um, also, Argo CD. We threw that out mostly because of the architecture that we went with. We wanted to have fully self-sufficient clusters, where no cluster is reliant on a centralized environment to work. Um, but the end basically ended up with Helm as a config source, together with Flux. So we are now using Helm charts to manage Helm charts, <laughs> but not using subcharts, but actually by stamping out Flux series, config maps, and secrets. Um, that also gave us the option to use Helm hooks for, for example, running migrations. Um, so if we now have a change in an upstream chart that we consume that is breaking, we can just basically run a Helm hook before upgrades and after upgrades to basically do all the necessary migration steps like sc uh, scaling down a deployment or deleting it so that the Helm up uh, upgrade doesn't fail. <sighs> Um, we now have versioned artifacts, which is also very nice. So I can literally just pin one cluster to one specific version and keep it there, and it will not change no matter what I do on other clusters. And if something breaks, I can easily roll back one cluster. And we literally, uh, we also only have one config file now. So what we did is basically introduce params for having a unified input for configuring everything that is site-specific or provider-specific. That's the same for every component that we have that exists one time per cluster in one config map and gets read by everything. Um, we have it versioned, so if we ever need to do changes, we can just introduce a V2. All of that is validated by um, JS uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Um, by the JSON validation that Helm provides uh, for values. So you can't even put in an invalid f field, or if you edit a new site and the version of that chart doesn't support it yet because it doesn't have configuration for it, you won't have an inconsistent behavior. But your reply will just fail, and you need to grab a newer version. Um, all of that functionality is built in into a library chart. So it's not a subchart, it's a library chart um, called params. That chart also contains a lot of helper functions that we build for our hierarchy. So we now basically have a hierarchy tree in M values that you can use per component. Where you can just basically build different feature flags and enable them. But if you ever need to change something in production, you can always just ever overwrite everything on a per cluster level. You can also just introduce secrets uh, on a per cluster level. And they will overwrite everything else in the tree. So from an architecture perspective, it looks like that. So we just have one customization. That applies a secret for secret values uh, and a conflict map for the other values gets reconciled by a component, in this case, shift load balancing, for example, which is the component that we use for providing load balancing services. It mostly uses Metal LB under the hood, but for some environments, also KubeWeb. That then generates a config map. And secrets direct, uh, com uh, consumed by the upstream Metal LB chart. That is also version pinned in that specific chart. So you can also just have a, run, a drop that runs uh, on migration. We needed to migrate our existing clusters to that approach. That was a bit painful. Um, 
mostly because of Helm. Helm expects a few things, uh, two annotations and one label for, to be precise, to, uh, uh, on every resource it manages. We couldn't really apply that inside the GitOps loop. Um, we then wrote tooling that basically iterated over every cluster, added those labels, then added our new component charts, and we then still needed to force upgrade Helm, so it actually started to overwrite values in cluster uh, and roll out the exact things that we wanted. Um, the cleanup of things that we didn't want afterwards was also quite easy because Flux already adds an annotation which Flux customization uh, applied uh, a resource or a label uh, which uh, that it can just filter by. So everything that is not uh, owned by Helm at that point can just be deleted and you have a clean class without orphaned resources. There are some caveats, though. It's still very complex. Um, so if you have an environment that is less complex, it's probably not worth for you to invest time building component charts to manage all of your stuff. Helm Go templates are still not ideal for a lot of things. They're hard to manage. Um, not everything is possible in a way that everybody can read it, let's call it that way. <laughs> um, template functions start to look ugly if you introduce a lot of values. And not all upstream components integrate well with that approach. So um, what I mean with that is basically um, if you have CRDs that are managed by an operator and you want to also apply C uh, uh, basically CRs uh, out of that CRD in your, in your component chart, you need to basically manually extract them from the operator if they're not published, uh, apply them using Helm and find a way that the operator actually doesn't manage them or really keep them in sync with the operator version. Or conclusions. Migrations are possible but painful, so if you can avoid them, avoid them. Um, we never plan to be as complex as we are right now because we, when we started, we really didn't know that our environment is as complex as it is. <laughs> there is no good solution for everybody. What works for you will be different than what works for me. And we're currently up adapting our charts um, to the flux detection that is currently in beta with uh, uh, the Helm operator of flux. Um, because that's basically the main downside that we had before or with that components uh, compared to customize, uh, customizations from Flux, they were, were not periodically reconciled. So the Helm chart was a apply once and that did uh, uh, and only on an upgrade uh, that was reapplied, but if you had drift in the meantime, that would never get automatically reconciled. There is a beta f feature in Flux v2 now that fixes that but there are some issues with some charts because they have weird interactions with operators, for example, and that breaks. <laughs> and we're currently writing tooling for do, uh, to do rollout in a staged manner uh, because we basically don't want to have upgrades on all clusters at the same time. Um, we want to really stage that into smaller batches, validate things, and then ramp up like you have... Uh, for example, in with in-cluster upgrades, we want to do a rolling uh, uh, upgrade over a complete fleet of clusters. Questions? So can you tell us about the rollouts that you talked about? So are you doing in-cluster upgrades, or are you doing, uh, creating a brand new version and migrating to the new version? We're doing in-cluster upgrades. Uh, so the question was uh, about our rollouts. Uh, we're doing in-cluster upgrades. Um, we just basically there is a Helm release in Git for every cluster that we just up the version uh, to the new chart um, that's hopefully tested in dev and then hopefully tested in ref. So it's progressing through the stages. So uh, the question was about why, 
we didn't use Argo. Um, mostly because our architecture is meant that every cluster is fully self-sufficient. So we have our centralized control plane for copy, but that is mostly just there for m mitigating failures and for, up uh, from, uh, for upgrades, but every other function in cluster is completely self-sufficient. Um, so for example, the monitoring stack that runs in a cluster is completely self-contained in the cluster. We have a Thanos in front of uh, the Prometheus in that cluster for us to centrally aggregate things. But if another cluster breaks or a control plane breaks, or whatever happens, that, ap that cluster, if that application will continue to run as it's expected. So we didn't want to basically remove that, ar uh, that architecture. So we can even roll out upgrades or fixes to that specific cluster if our management plane is broken or it doesn't exist anymore. You can still roll out the security bug fix. You can change configuration on that cluster. They're completely self-dependent. Yeah. Yeah, but we would need to have a few hundred Argo instances. We are currently at uh, about 170 clusters. Yeah, but they're easier to manage and install because they're just custom resource definitions that get one, one time applied and then self-reconcile. Um, the question was whether we uh, couple Argo and Flux. So we're just we're still just using Flux. There is no Argo in our new approach. It's still completely self-contained with Flux v2 CRDs. We will probably not switch over um, because Flux is getting the necessary um, features that we need from it. Yes, thanks. Um, so, at the moment, do you the one that changes stuff in the Git repo? How is that done? Uh, is it kind of humans all, and how is a kind of, or is there any UI in front or? Um, it's like mostly uh, our platform team, so the people that are responsible for the platform. Um, we have tooling that automates a lot of the things, um, but it's currently mostly run on our PCs. That's not something we want for the long term. Um, a team member of mine is going to hate me, but it's mostly held together by Python glue code. Um, there are Python scripts that just iterate over every cluster. We have uh, different resources that just pin specific clusters. We have a resource that handles which target version should be in every cluster. There's just tooling that manually reconciles it. It's not automated yet. It's the plan to do so, but it's not done yet. Okay, and the, the kind of, uh, is there any access control between, so if you have a monorepo, you have kind of 170 clusters in the same repo. Is there any use case for having just someone access a couple of them? Uh, yes, we have owner files and approvals. Um, so it's GitLab. Um, we have a way too complicated owner file. We have some CI hooks that uh, are, do for uh, things like notification of our internal tenants. Uh, we have also uh, that will fail if you do some changes, and then only a very limited amount of people will be able to merge it. Um, but in general, we have owner files for different things, um, or one owner file that allows different people to merge uh, and approve different things using merge requests. And uh, I think two people are actually allowed to circumvent that. Maybe the last question, if there's no other, did you consider Q uh, for the templating stuff? Uh, what again? Uh, Q, C, U, E. We never looked okay. at it. Okay. Well, a uh, short question is, uh, did I understand correctly that you kind of abusing Helm as just templating engine uh, to generate uh, configs? Uh. Mostly, yes. Um, so we use Helm to basically stamp out configuration for other, for Helm charts, basically. And then uh, you just proceed with customize, right? 
Every, it's just basically creating a Helm uh, release CRD uh, and the necessary Helm chart repo uh, for Flux in the cluster, and then Flux will reconcile all of that on its own. Okay, my now the major question. What would you do if you would start fresh all over? Uh, honestly, uh, I would, we would try to uh, streamline our environments more um, and accept less weird environments. Um, right now we are there, we have things in there that are in production, so we can't get rid of it uh, easily. Um, ideally, we would never have started doing things there. But would you still go for this architecture with Flux and, and the Python scripts and Helm, uh, you know, the whole quite complex environment, or would you go for a more simple architecture? Um, we are working towards a bit simpler architecture by writing more of our own operators and our own CRDs to manage things. Uh, it's not fully done yet. It's done for some parts, um, mostly around actually creating those things around Kapi. Um, that's where we currently put the emphasis of, of writing uh, uh, that operator code, but we also have plans to extend that into uh, the components management and basically automate git commits uh, through that. We still want to have the intermediate step of git so we can basically revert individual clusters, block put commits to that git repository and make sure that way that we don't break, uh, break production environments uh, because if we break production environments, the impact is a bit higher than usual. It's not just a web application that's not there. It might be emergency calling for 20% of Germany that's just gone. Thank you. So I guess no more questions. Then thank you all for your time. <laughs>